Oh, there it is. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Stephen Weigel, and my presentation is over my uh, recital. Uh, my first composition recital that I finished at the end of my senior year. Uh, so my presentation is called Electronics, Media-Based Composition, and Opportunity. I thought these were sort of the three values or uh, concepts that were most useful to extract from all of the proceedings because my projects tend to get really complicated and sort of interweave into each other and it's hard to find a focus. But the recital allowed me to concentrate all of my efforts on one thing. So that was really helpful. Now, the project requirements were fairly simple. I was to finish the recital and come up with appropriate pieces. Uh, I was given a lot of free reign here, which was really nice. So I tried to hybridize uh, music media production based techniques with composition techniques, which we'll also get into, although I don't want to focus too much on composition since this is an MMP related project. However, composition was heavily involved. So the recital involved doing a lot. Uh, I had to write the pieces, uh, schedule and coordinate with uh, many individuals, not just performers, but also people who were setting up the recital and other places for rehearsal, uh, like Pruis and, you know, the large ensemble room up here in Sursa. Uh, I also tried to design some instruments for this recital. Not all of them were finished because it was a lot of work, but I was able to advertise on the poster with a few different instruments because I uh, like to create instruments in other tuning systems or I'm interested in microtonality. So most of my instruments have ended up being in 19 tone equal temperaments so that they can all play in the same tuning system. So that's been sort of a, a hobby that's translated into a bigger thing. Uh, and of course I had to get people to go. Uh, then after the recital I was required to make a website which I've also done on Wix.com uh, and this is a showcase of just some of the many things that I have come up with during the recital and uh, other lectures that I've given. I also produced a video over one of my pieces, Tenacious Chorale, which involved the mistuning of 12-tone guitars, and another video over my vocoder piece. And the vocoder piece is still in progress. So this is the uh, recital poster that I used to advertise my recital. Uh, it's a bit jarring with the black, but you can see that there's like a lot of chaos and excitement, which is something that I wanted to portray kind of like rebellious and edgy with like the wild hair and all the insane things happening. Not to mention all of the custom made instruments. There's the marimba behind me, a uh, connects drum, a kalimba, uh, the black box in the top left that says J.I., connects in the background, and other things. So, I just am sort of advertising it as this insane hodgepodge of things. And the numbers there refer to different tuning systems that I used uh, in the recital. I did end up using all of them. So 8-tone, 9-tone, 22-tone, 19-tone, 12-tone, which is ours, and just intonation. Uh, all the numbers refer to equal temperament, and they're actually a parody of this poster. So that is why I have all the lines there connecting the numbers. Uh, so that was something fun I thought I would include. So the reason I picked electronics, media-based composition, and opportunity is fairly well known, but it applies to students in a very direct way. Uh, because there is a great utility in understanding how electronics work, and it can even serve as an advantage. Uh, if you want to work in certain fields, you can say, oh, I know these electronics. You know, that's a very, very important thing to have. It doesn't matter if you're an MMP student or a composition student, uh, but I certainly wanted to increase my knowledge of electronics through this project, and I have uh, a little bit, although most of my uh, work has come through sort of experimental composition techniques. Um, in the MMP department, there's also a sometimes a requirement to write. A lot of times, actually, like in songwriting class or in computer music class, where you have to create computer music compositions. So composition and MMP aren't really that far off of each other. They are very related, which is why I thought this project would be fitting for an MMP project. Uh, I'm also very motivated to compose, and I want the next stage of my career to be something where I'm recognized for my composition. So, the goal of this project has sort of been to get a lot of compositions in writing and then continue the process so that I can build the composition resume because I'm switching to composition from MMP. So now let's talk about the electronics a little bit. Uh, basically, the setup at the recital was uh, pretty simple. I had a table, actually very like this table, uh, to my right, 
uh, if I'm on the stage, you know, stage right, is over to the right, and I'm sitting at a table, down, but I'm not in the center. So this table was really nice because it allowed me to work at my laptop and be connected to the speakers, but I was also out of the way of the performers. So that allowed me to sort of get my electronic pieces and my acoustic pieces in there separately. Uh, and I worked with people beforehand to make sure that everything worked, like the black box levels had to be correct, and all of the other things uh, that go into setting up. Although it was actually a fairly simple setup when you think about it, I just had to do one switch between plugging into an audio box and not plugging into an audio box because of the vocoding. But that was a pretty simple switch to make. And when it comes to the electronically based writing, uh, I'll briefly talk about five pieces I wrote for the recital that used electronics and MMP techniques. Uh, one of them was the Skag Witching Hour. This is my first, I consider it my first mature computer music piece. And the second is Specious Factoid, which is uh, a strange 19-tone minimalism experiment that is also unfinished. Uh, now, the Sky at Witching Hour, you could technically call a media-based composition because it has a visual score. Wrong one. Uh, it has a visual score, but it didn't actually get, uh, you know, placed on the projector at the recital because uh, there was just sort of an oversight and everything was really busy. Uh, so I consider that an electronic composition. So let's listen to the Sky at Witching Hour, and I'll talk about some of the techniques I used. So the techniques I used to create this piece were actually fairly simple. I just wanted to take a bunch of simple techniques and make them very complicated. So it's kind of a little bit like FM synthesis if you're oscillating an oscillator. You just take two simple things and you make a bunch of complicated things. Uh, so I was using granular synthesis as well as the very basic processes of pitch shifting and reversing and then strange reverberation and layering. So I used a lot of layering to create the gestures in this piece with like, you know, the crackling sounds and the falling sounds and all of those different kinds of moves. Uh, I also only used three uh, sound samples to create the piece. I used a, a crackling fire, a bell sound, and a wind chime sound. And there were lots of ways to make really interesting harmony in this piece. Uh, I didn't really think about it that much, but I wanted there to be little moments in the piece where you hear pitch. Um, which sort of draws, I think, draws the average listener into it a little bit more. You know, there's sort of been a resistance to computer music because it's very hard to get it to sound like regular music. So I feel like the pitch is this kind of aid that helps. And it sounds really cool. I think it fits within the texture as well. So that was my most mature computer music work. Now let's look at Specious Factoid a little bit. We won't play very much of that. Specious Factoid actually cut out during the recital due to an error, so you didn't get to hear the whole piece, but I'll be revising it nonetheless. Specious Factoid was also going to feature the 19-ton marimba, but there was a misunderstanding where they did not get finished. However, I am working on it for the future. <laughs> Tell that the guitar has a strange effect on it, 
And in the second movement, I actually sort of reversed the process that I did. two microphones that aren't normally used to these kind of things. I had a very specific goal for the acoustic guitar, and that was to make it sound ambiguously like either an acoustic or electric guitar. So I actually recorded it with a D112 and a KM184 facing at odd placements. The D112 was very close to the center, so there's that like midzy ring you kind of get from guitars and recordings that you don't usually want a lot of, and I wanted a lot of that with the D112 to play with distortion. And then the KM184 was sort of pointed halfway between the neck and the bridge. So I had sort of a basic acoustic guitar sound that I was layering with a distorted D12, D112 sound, which I used an amp plug-in to sort of affect. And then when it got louder, it would sort of distort in a way that an electric guitar would. Um, I would say this piece isn't really finished because I've got a little bit of, I think, textural revisions to do, and I would love to actually have the instrument. But uh, those are sort of the techniques that I used when writing this piece, creating an interesting contrast. I also uh, changed some of the tracks. There are parts when I've taken the sound sample from a track and scooted it an octave higher and made it very soft with the pitch shift and then included lots of reverb. So that's where you get that otherworldly, really strange sound. Because, of course, when you pitch shift the sound, sometimes you get a grainy effect where you can tell that it's been pitch shifted, and you can kind of hear that in the mix, but it sounds like an effect and not a mistake or like, you know, a YouTube video where someone is just learning how to pitch shift. Uh, so that's, the, that's sort of the electronic section. Now let's move to some pieces that are more involved with media-based composition. Uh, just Familiarity was a 22-tone equal-tempered piece that I sang with a backing track. Uh, then there was Rock Meets Ocean, which used my vocoder instrument, and Tenacious Crowl, which used mistuned guitars. Now before we move to the website to look at these three pieces, let me briefly show you some of the instruments. Uh, so these are two of the instruments that I used uh, when I was playing the piece. There were little interludes where I would stop singing and the backing track would just play. So then I jumped out on the stage and I would play the guitar for a little while during the fake guitar solo. <laughs> and then during the fake trumpet solo, I would play the fake trumpet, which actually has moving vowels. You know, <laughs> so there's that. Uh, I would love to make these uh, into a future project someday. I actually had another piece of plan with them. They've just been lying around ever since I built them uh, as a high schooler, so I decided I wanted to use it for a comedic effect. Uh, the whole song has kind of a comedic vibe to it. I'm kind of acting like this mad scientist who wishes he could be more microtonal and who's like mildly pissed off at the definition of music theory that we have today. So it's so rebellious, you know. Oh man. Uh, and using these instruments made it even more rebellious. And it lightened the tone of the hall, I thought. After I got everyone to laugh, they were probably less scared of all my music. Uh, <laughs> especially the 22-tone music, which, uh, you know, it sounds... You know, people hear it, and they would say to me, you know, at first it sounded wrong, but then I got used to it. But that describes really my whole experience with microtonality. Uh, so now let's take a look at the website that I've made. There we go. All right, so this website uh, just has a few pages. Uh, here's a page about me. A little bit of an explanation about what I like to do and the skills I have and what I'm good at. Um, I sort of tried to emulate Aaron Hunt's website a little bit. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Let's actually see if we can go there. Oh, no. Uh, and he has a nice little bio and then little organized pages for all of his events. Uh, I thought this website at this point should be a showcase for the things that I had done sort of during my recital and over my years. So I also have been giving lectures. And this is something that I decided I liked to do and then it's sort of grown into uh, an academic venture. And there are a lot of topics that I want to talk about. So this is one reason I feel qualified to be a music composition major because I'm suddenly finding that I have 
uh, not new things to say, but things to say that nobody is saying, particularly about microtonality. Ball State has never encouraged me to study microtonality. That has been uh, a venture I have undertaken on my own. And I've learned a lot from it, and I think uh, sharing a lot of the information is a really educational experience. So, like this uh, lecture at the Kennedy Library, for example, I didn't have to do it, I just took it. I just took the idea on my own, and then the same is true for this uh, honors thesis lecture, which is about my uh, honors thesis, uh, a scale of set theory that I'm trying to come up with. Uh, and so there are a lot of these, and I plan to have many more. I don't have any future ideas listed here, but these videos sort of uh, give you an idea of what it's all about. Uh, and then there are some recitals and performances here that I performed at that I also plan to add to once I have written more pieces. So then, we go over to the music page, and we have mostly it was from the capstone thus far. Uh, when I've been at Ball State, I've worked on a lot of film music. I'd say the two films I'm most uh, proud of right now are Development and The Door Jostler. Development actually won third place in the National Audience Awards uh, last, I believe last fall, so like last semester. Uh, and Development was uh, a film that I really worked hard on. And The Door Jostler is something that I made for one of my friends that turned out to be his most comedic film. I also, coincidentally, am an actor in the film. Uh, regarding my SoundCloud, I tend to be popular on that because of this. Uh, this was a video game that got created, uh, and it was based on a television show called Community. Uh, and they needed people to remaster some of the music from the episode, because the only sound files they had were while people were talking and stuff. So they couldn't, like, extract the raw data. So I was able to figure out all of these songs by ear and recreate them, which was not something anyone else on the website did. Uh, so that was very useful for the project, and I ended up making about 30 tracks for that, I think, two summers ago. Uh, but one of the crowning achievements, I would say, is this video demonstrating uh, Tenacious Corral. We're not going to listen to the actual piece, uh, or a lot of it, but we'll see most of the video, and then I'll show you the black box vocoding stuff. Hello, my name is Stephen Weigel, and today you'll be watching a video that is a recording and demonstration of my nine-tone equal-tempered piece, Tenacious Corral. Microtonal music is something that I am very interested in exploring, and, by a 20th century European definition, is simply music that is not tuned in the same way as our piano today. Microtonal music is very old, but for some people it has been a topic that breeds lots of discussion and new ideas, because it doesn't get a lot of attention and exploration uh, in a contemporary environment. Microtonality doesn't always sound out of tune, and it offers many interesting areas for exploration, contrary to popular belief. Classical guitarist and music composition teacher Derek Johnson was the faculty member who requested that I write this piece after I had written another nine-tone piece for him called In Our Own Little Worlds. So now, let's take a look at how Tenacious Crow was created. Our piano uses 12-tone equal temperament, and this means that there are 12 notes equally spaced in the octave. Let me play a 12-note chromatic scale for you. You can count that there are 12 notes in there. Now, the scale that I'm using for this piece, one of them, is the 9-tone equal-tempered scale. So in the same way that there are 12 equally spaced notes in one octave for 12-tone, there are nine equally spaced notes in an octave in nine tone. So here is the nine tone chromatic scale. See, only nine notes there. When pitch gradation gets finer, we label things in terms of cents, which is just sort of a finer way to label things. An octave is 1200 cents. So then you can divide 1,200 by your equal temperament number to get the number of cents that a smallest step has. So if 1,200 is divided by 12 to an equal temperament, we get 100 cents per step. But in 9-tone, when we divide 1,200 by 9, 
we get 133.3 repeating cents per step. And as a result, the step is slightly larger. The composition of Tenacious Krell was different than in our own little worlds because it involves real instruments. And I'm a big fan of writing pieces for real instruments because I feel like that gets people involved. So with Tenacious Krell, I used nine tone, not only because I liked it, but because I then discovered that it had a common property with 12, namely that I could divide by three and 12 could as well. This means that it's possible to play nine tone music on a 12 tone equal tempered guitar. And similarly, also possible to play eight tone music on a 12 tone equal tempered guitar because they both divide by four. So the way I use this division is to only play the common three tone equal temperament or the common factor of three between nine tone and 12 tone. And this is done through the augmented chord. So I only play zero, four, eight, and 12 and all of their octaves when I'm playing in nine tone. And likewise, when I play in eight tone, I only play zero, three, six, and nine. I'll demonstrate the nine tone scale briefly and I'll leave you to fill in the blanks about the eight tone scale, which has a similar analog, but it's not quite the same. So with the nine tone scale, I wanted to tune things consecutively because it's hard to play in this format if you're only playing zero, four, eight, and 12. So the most convenient way to label things and tune them was to tune adjacent notes, and then you could easily play the chromatic scale by simply ascending four, eight, and 12, uh, like this. Here's the first note of nine tone, the second note of nine tone, and the third note of nine tone. So when I play these strings up, zero, 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 I get part of the chromatic scale. And then if I play up the fours, I continue up it. And same with the eights up to 12. So I can play the full nine tone chromatic scale by barring 0, 4, 8, and 12 because the scale is just divided into three chunks, the common factor, like this. Using guitar turned out to be a very likable format for the players because microtonal music is usually hard to read and in this case, we had music that was fairly easy to read. As some of you may know, uh, tab guitar notation is fairly popular. So I used tab to convey information to the players of this piece, who were Daniel Sittler on bass guitar and Sam Gordon on electric guitar. Thank you both. Uh, this information was easy to convey because they had to know nothing about the actual tuning system. They simply had to tune the strings and then read the tab, and the notes were also there with the rhythms. Regarding the tuning, I also prepared special tuning files uh, that we would play each time on my computer before we started practice. Uh, we would practice every Monday, and our hard work paid off and the performance was a great success. I also notated 12-tone scent deviations into the music. Uh, this was for the actual staff involving rhythms and not the tab part of the staff. Now, scent deviations are often a little bit difficult to notate because you simply use an arrow attached to the accidental and then write in the number of scents off it is. But in nine and eight tone equal, all of the scent deviations can be expressed as either 33, 50, or not at all, zero. So that made the writing very easy. I also decided to do a studio recording of this piece, which is the one you'll hear today because although the performance was excellent, there was a clarity that it lacked, and I would like to have the quality of a studio performance. It is especially important to be clear with microtonal music, because if you're not, then the listener might think, well, this is out of tune, since it's unclear. So now, the video I'm going to present to you, along with the music, is the studio recording of Tenacious Corral, recorded in Studio 2, MMP Studios, using direct inputs and microphones. Here is the result of all of that hard work.
So anyway, uh, that's Tenacious Corral, sort of the big, the big highlight in Capstone. And then I also have some other uh, instruments here. These are the instrument ideas I have. Uh, there's a professional named Aaron Spalding who's working on my Roomba keys, uh, who lives in Lafayette. Uh, here's the equipment he uses to tune. Uh, he uses a bandsaw and it shaves a little bit off of each Roomba key, then tunes it by ear, and then comes back to keep shaving. So I'll have to do all the fine tuning, but he's doing all of that tough stuff of hollowing out the key. Because the more you hollow out a key, the lower it gets which is why you have to be so precise with it. It's an irreversible act. So if you get the key too low, well, that key is now no good. Or you have to scale everything lower, which is a big waste of time. So it's easier to just make a new key. I have a guitar that was created by my uncle. He's an engineer. Uh, I've also created uh, resonator pipes already for the marimba, although they might turn into a different instrument. And then these are just some other ideas I have, like I want to propose uh, an instrument idea to glass blowing, since Ball State conveniently has that located here. I've uh, obtained a keyboard carcass that I can, you know, gut and like re-figure to 19, uh, which will be a little hard because of how you have to alternate the diatonic keys. Uh, but here is the vocoder, which I'm also talking about in media-based composition. Uh, I used an Arduino and Max MSP. I'll skip a little bit forward and go to here. Arduino plus Max MSP because Max MSP is really good for uh, <laughs> easily creating musical environments with numbers without a lot of heavy coding. And Arduino is very friendly and usually cheap as well. Uh, so these three objects here on the box are infrared sensors. So when I wave my hand in front of them, uh, the data going into the computer changes. And so I'm able to create musical effects based on that. In fact, this one broke right before the recital. Well, it didn't really break, but the connection no longer works, and I didn't have time to fix it. I couldn't figure it out. So, so let's go I'm to going the to patch. Have to so what I'm going to do is I'm going to. And the patch will demonstrate uh, some of the compositional techniques that I used to shape the sound. But it was making things change. You can hear it by voice. <laughs> uh, Isn't that great? Uh, now the song that formed. is a panel on the right side, and then some of the buttons are lit up based on what effects are active. So that's sort of how I controlled the vocoder and used it during my piece. Um, and dose of familiarity, you'll just have to hear some other time because of the timing right now. So let's just close with uh, a few words about opportunity. Uh, I feel like a lot of the opportunities I've taken aren't really conventional opportunities, and I really feel like uh, I'm sort of changing and moving into new territory in that I've found what I'm good at and I'm going to keep sticking with it, which is kind of uh, lecturing on microtonality, I feel like, is a real, a real passion of mine. So, but I mean, it hasn't really, I don't know, I, I kind of feel like it was given to me and I need to run with it. Uh, by spotting a hole on the PowerPoint, I mean, there's something that nobody is talking about, so I feel like I need to fill it in. And this is actually how my theory got started as well. I was like, well, has anyone taken factorials of step sizes before? And it turns out, probably some people have, but they don't really care. Maybe it was an idle experiment. You know, nobody really famous has done it that I can find. Uh, I also feel like I've become better at talking about things, so it helps me play to my strengths, and it's a rare skill that I have to be able to talk about such things. Uh, it also really helps me be independent. As I mentioned, the Kennedy Library Lecture was something I decided to do on my own, so it really helped me do something outside of school that was uh, worthwhile. And then, of course, it helps you practice networking. This is not only true in the recital, but also with the lectures in question. It helps me uh, interact with the community in a positive way and sort of get my name out there, uh, as will the website and the material from the recital. So I think I accomplished all my goals this semester, and I'm looking forward to doing a lot of composing in the future with the tools and techniques I've learned from this recital and the subsequent project materials. Thank you.
Any questions? <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> oh, I did have one question. Did you record the um, Corral, Tenacious Corral, live? Like everybody was recording at once, or did you do it in separate parts? We did it live. Okay. Um, and then there was minor multi tracking on my part. Yeah. Essentially. But that main, where it was showing Dan, Sam, and you playing, you were all doing that at the same time? Yes, okay. we were. Yeah. Cool. It seemed much more relaxed than in the, on the stage. Was it just you played it more? Everybody seemed to comfortable. Maybe it's because they were in the studio and they knew they could do it as many times they wanted. But... Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I would actually say the opposite of that. I think the, the studio take actually went a little bit late because the, the tempo changes, there were a lot of them, and some of them were goofy in Pro Tools, which is a little bit my fault, so I had to keep changing it. But, I mean, I think everybody was pretty relaxed in the studio. They knew the piece better by then. And once you know how something sounds and you know where your part fits in with it, it really helps. So I think the fact that they knew that a lot more really uh, played into how much better the studio performance was. Would you stand up and show those instruments again? I'm sorry, I didn't get them. Yeah, of course. Here's two of them. <laughs> the Kinex Trumpet, uh, <laughs> official name. I think you should get some nice pictures of these from your website. Like, get some portraits, you know, really... Well, lit. he's even got a vibrato bar on there. Yes, and the vibrato bar uses the Bendy Kinex piece of size oh, two, the yeah. only two that I own, actually. Oh, oh so these are some very rare uh, That's parts. That's fantastic, Steven. I just had a lot of these, and there really was no use for them except to build a giant fake band for the future. So, yeah. I have another guitar also that uh, actually used Kinex instructions. So that was when I decided I wanted to build more instruments because this one, as you can tell, it's like a little bit unconventional and loopy and like the structures are really layered in an odd way. But the other guitar that is conventionally colored with the normal parts is very, uh, it's very easy to see that it's made from instructions because it's basically just a giant frame. I got that other one again. I think you should add some glow sticks for live, live performances. Oh my gosh. That would be great. Well, pick up the other one again if you would. Or like those things you get from like Disney World that do spinning lights and stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you could uh, try to license these to Toys R Us or something. I mean, some simplified version, I mean. I tried to contact Kinex about it and like, you know, make some cash money from like a commercial, but they didn't have any contact information. Uh, maybe I'll have to track that down. I would still follow them the future. and uh, do some kind of, you know, get on their Facebook page or something. Yeah, yeah. They, you know, Kinex is really good. You've made novel use of their. their, their, their uh, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, right. Kinex are still in stores and very popular. Are they really? Yes, oh. yes. Oh, wow. and, they do, and they do have several advantages over Legos. The price of Lego plastic rose a lot quicker than uh, the yeah, plastic for Kinex, like but hmm. yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I like Kinex and Legos. I think they both have advantages. Kinex don't break as easily, usually. Um, although. They are a little bit uh, flimsy. Yeah. Like, if I were to put this in my car and accidentally drop it, it would break. So, <clears throat> stuff like that. Uh, I'd really love to use Max MSP plus these instruments sometime, but I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. You know, my definition of good music is something where you go home and you have ideas. And, you know, some concerts just depress me and, and shut me down. I go home and just want to like, watch TV. But something <laughs> like this, it's just stimulating. You have so many ideas I just want to go home and bake something, you know, so I think you're, sure. it's a sign you're onto something. Mm -hmm. I think that the idea with the glass museum is smart, you know, the mm -hmm. entrepreneurial thing, and what are my opportunities, and um, you know, just grabbing stuff and doing it. I, you said nobody's mm -hmm. been uh, encouraging you with microtone and stuff, but Derek's a good person for that. Do you know he's, he's going, talked about it. He's yeah. going to New York this summer to do something with arch instruments. And he's stuff. Uh, playing that prison piece. Yes, I actually am meaning to meet with him again on final week. Yeah, talk about that. You know, just see if you can go to New York and see what it's all. You know, what the show's all about. Yeah, it'd be great. Well, congratulations and thank you very much. Thanks, you guys. Awesome. Good job.